to enjoy today, to see your glory in everything that we see around us. Father, we pray that you be with us as we go through this time of study tonight. Please be with Gary in the message and the lesson that he has prepared. Please let us be able to take a lot from it and to be able to apply it to our lives and show others around us your love. Father, we thank you for the upcoming Fishers of Men class. Please let it be well received and very helpful to those that are able to attend. Please be with the speaker as he travels. Let him have safe travels everywhere he goes. Father, we pray that you most of all forgive us of our sins. And we do thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die for our sins. There is no other perfect sacrifice that would do except for his perfect sacrifice that he made because he loves us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, and thank you for being here again this evening as we continue to take a look at the body of Christ as a functioning, united body. In the body of Christ, a tremendous organization, a tremendous group of people, wonderful people, and isn't it wonderful that God created the church and left the church to be the body of Christ here on earth? We have seen in Romans that the body needs to conform together. In 1 Corinthians, we saw that we need to submit together. In 2 Corinthians, we learned that we need to be comforted together. Paul recommends to the churches in Galatia that they carry together, and to the church in Ephesus that they walk together. We have seen in Paul's epistle to the Philippians that we need to build together, and in his letter to the Colossians that we need to grow together. Tonight, let's take a look at his first and second letters to the church in Thessalonica, where we find that Paul tells us we need to live together. That does not mean we need to live in the same location, the same address, the same building. That means that we just need to be working alongside each other and, and living our lives together. First, though, we need to ask this question, by what authority did Paul teach these things? There are many people who say that Paul is, Paul is speaking his own idea, his own opinions, that he's speaking from his own prejudices, that he doesn't like women and other things. And that's just not true. It's clear from the Bible that Paul is not expressing his own ideas. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the first three verses, Paul says, Finally, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And then in verse 8, he adds, Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And by the way, Paul says something similar to the church in Colossae, in, first, uh, in church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, in verse 6, Paul says, Now we command you, brethren, 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Verse 12 says, Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and to eat their own bread. There are many good sources for what we would call apologetics. Apologetics does not mean we are apologizing in the sense that we're saying we're sorry about something. In a Christian sense, apologetics is showing why we believe what we believe. Apologetics Press has just put out a, a new book. It's called The Bible is from God, a sampling of proofs. And they have many other uh, good materials for all ages. If you want to start, uh, one place to start looking for evidence about the Bible being the Word of God, Apologetics Press is a place to start. Not only does Paul claim to be speaking by the authority of Jesus, but Peter says that Paul's writings are Scripture. So if Paul is just making it up, then Peter is too. Uh, we know that neither one is true, that Paul is not making it up and Peter is not making it up, that Paul's writings are Scripture. We find then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, as we seek to learn how to become a united functioning body, we must be united in our work of faith, our labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. That's what he says there in verse 3. Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and your labor of love and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. We must, we must be united in our work of faith, our labor of love, and our steadfastness of hope. Note, though, that these three are, not, are active, they're not passive. These are not things we do sitting on the couch at home. These are things that we go out and are involved in. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Chapter 3 and verse 8 says, for now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. And chapter 4 Beginning in verse 1, it says, Finally, then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. So this is something that we go out and do. This is not something that we just sit at home and think about passively. We must be united in our work of faith actively, uh, going out and doing what God wants us to do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith. We must be united in our work of faith. We do this with power, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. To this end also we pray for you always, that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. As we go about doing this work of faith, we need to understand that we're not alone, that we have the power of God. And so we are united in our work of faith with power. As we go about with a working faith, we need to understand that we exhort not from error or from impurity or from deceit. We saw something similar, I think, last week in, in the, the, the epistle that we read. In First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul points out that our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. We must be united in our work of faith with power, and we need to exhort not from error or impurity or deceit. In chapter two, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, we read, And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs of false wonders. And then in verse 10 it picks up, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they may believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. We need to make sure that we love the truth and that we believe the truth. If we want to believe a lie, if we insist on being deceived, God will allow us to be deceived. We must be united in our work of faith, not seeking to please men, but seeking to please God, as we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who examines our hearts. 
We must be united in our work of faith, not with flattering speech, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5. For we never came with flattering speech, he points out, as you know, nor with a pretext of greed, God is witness. And so we don't come with flattering speech, uh, down in verses 13 through 15 of that same chapter. Paul says, and for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. We are united in our work of faith, not with flattering speech and not with pretext of greed. As we read in, in 2 Thess 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5, where he said, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. We are united in our work of faith because we do not seek glory from men. In that next verse, verse 6, Paul says, Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. We must be united in our work of faith. We do this when, it, when we accept the word of God's message for what it really is, the word of God that performs its work in you who believe. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, we read, And for this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also perform, performs its work in you who believe. We must be united in our work of faith, and when we do this, our faith will be greatly enlarged, as was the faith of those in Thessalonica. Paul tells them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. We must be united in our work of faith. We are united with, uh, united with power, exhorting not from error or impurity or deceit, not pleasing men but God, not with flattering speech, nor with pretext of greed, nor seeking the glory of men, but accepting the word of God's message for what it really is. As we do this, our faith will be greatly enlarged. We must be united in our labor of love, as we've read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love. We do this by thinking kindly of each other. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you, we become united in our labor of love when we think kindly of each other and when we actually long to see each other. When we're apart from each other, we want to be, want to be together, and this causes us to long to see each other. We need to pray to see each other's faces and complete what is lacking in each other's face, as Paul expresses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face, and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all had the same attitude that we were earnestly seeking to see each other's face, that we wanted to complete what is lacking in each other's faith, that you complete what is lacking in mine and I complete what is lacking in yours as we become united in our labor of love. We are united in our labor of love when we love the brethren, as we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 9. Now, as to the love of the brethren, Paul writes, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel all, uh, still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you may behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. 
We need to love the brethren. And Paul says that we need to practice this. It's not just a theory that we have. It's something that we put into our lives. We put into practice. And no matter how we're doing it, we need to excel. We need to get even better in our love for each other. We are united in our labor of love when we are morally upright. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. We must be united in our labor of love by leading a moral life. And this needs to be a quiet life, as Paul expresses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11, where he urges the church in Thessalonica, the Christians in Thessalonica, to make it their ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend to your own business and to work with your hands, just as we commanded you. We must lead a quiet life. And he says there that we need to attend to our own business and we need to work with our own hands. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, from verse 6, Paul says, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you. Picking up in verse 10, he says, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order, If anyone will not work, neither let him eat. For we hear that some among you, some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. We must be united in our labor of love by behaving properly toward outsiders, as we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 12, where Paul simply says, so that you may behave properly toward outsiders and may not be in any need. We need to behave properly toward others, toward outsiders, by not being in need. We're always aware of the needs of others and ready to help others. And that's the kind of reputation that we want to have in the community with those around us. We don't want to be thought of as people who always have their hands out. We're always looking for something from somebody else instead of looking for a way to help other people. If we need help, we need to ask for it. And we are ready to help each other. But the, we don't need to create a, a reputation of that's all we do. We're always looking for something from someone else. Paul points out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and 12, verse 12, that the Lord will cause us to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men. And he says, And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you. We, we must be united in our labor of love. We need to behave properly toward outsiders to not be in need. And the Lord will cause us to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men. And as a result, their love toward one another grew even greater. As we find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. If we want to be a functioning, united body of Christ, we must be united in our labor of love, thinking kindly of each other, longing to see each other, praying to see our fa each other's faces and completing what's lacking in our faith, by loving the brethren, being morally upright, leading a quiet life, attending to our own business, working with our hands, behaving properly toward outsiders and not being in need, increasing and abounding in love for all. And if we do this, our love toward one another will grow. And we must be united in our steadfastness of hope, as we've seen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope 
in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 12, Paul urges, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what, rest what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that they might believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. We must be united in our steadfastness of hope, our hope is that we will all rise again. Remember that hope is not something that we hope might happen. Hope is something we're assured of. And our steadfastness, steadfastness of hope tells us that all will rise again, as we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. We must be united in our steadfastness of hope, understanding that all will rise again. Christ rose from the grave. And that being true, the dead in Christ will rise when he returns, and all will meet him in the air. And as Paul says, we need to comfort one another with this steadfast hope. We are united in our steadfastness of hope, when we understand the times and the epochs, as Paul explains in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, from verse 1. Now as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief, for you were all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as other, others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. We must be united in our steadfast hope, knowing all these things about what is going to happen. We need to understand that ultimately evil will lose, as we find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, from verse 6. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not go, know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 
and these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. We need to understand that evil will lose and that good will triumph as we find in those last two verses where he says that the, the, the previous ones will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was, delete, was believed. Notice the contrast between destruction and marveling at God. Evil will lose. Good will triumph. We need to choose to be with the good. You know, too often we're presented with two options, a really good option and a really bad option. And how many people choose the really bad option? It makes no sense at all. We, we have night and day. We have the best possible option and the worst possible option. What are we going to choose? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Paul says, To this end also we pray for you always, that our God may count you worthy of your calling, and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power in order that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Evil is going to lose ultimately, and good is going to win. We need to be with the good. We need to remember always that God will bring with Jesus certain people, as we find in First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, those Christians who have died before Jesus comes, that he will bring them with him. And he also tells us that those who are alive will meet him in the air. We must be uni united in our steadfast of hope, because our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, will do th certain things for us. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17, Paul prays, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. As we look at Paul's instructions about how to be a functioning uh, united body, as he talks to the church in Thessalonica, we need to live together practicing certain things. This is a rather lengthy passage, and, and I hope you'll just write down the reference and go back and look at it, because we do not have time to stop and look at these things. But this is an incredible passage. Make a note of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, where it says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you, and have charge over you in the Lord, and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And when we do this, God will sanctify us, as we read in chapter 5 and verse 23, where he said, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be a united functioning body, we need to be united in our work of faith with power, exhorting not from error, impurity, or deceit, not pleasing men but God, not with flattering speech or pretext of greed or seeking the glory of men, but accepting the word of God's message for what it really is, 
And if we do that, this, our faith will be greatly enlarged. We must be united in our labor of love, thinking kindly of each other, longing to see each other, praying to see each other's faces and, and complete what is lacking in each other's faith. Loving the brethren, being morally upright, leading a quiet life, attending to our own business, working with our own hands, behaving properly toward outsiders and not being in need, increasing and abounding in love for all. And if we do this, our love toward one another will grow. And we must be united in our steadfastness of hope, understanding that all will rise again. And as to the times and epochs, we know that the evil will lose, good will triumph, we must be with the good. And if we do this, God will bring with Jesus those who are his when Jesus returns. This week, take time to list something good about each member of the congregation. Uh, you should have a directory such as this one. Just go through the directory person by person and just think of something good about that person. You might even take time to just say a little prayer for that person. There may be, you may be aware of certain needs that they have. And they may have needs that you're not aware of, but take time to pray for each member of the congregation. And this is how we can live together as a united functioning body. Ask yourself, what is your faith? What is your love? And what is your hope? It's interesting as we look at these three things in Paul's instructions to the church in Thessalonica, it reminds us of something in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where it talks about love, and it sums it up now by these thing, these three, faith, hope, and love. Ask yourself, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? And do you love God enough to keep his commandments? And is your hope in the resurrection? If you want to know what your Bible has to say about these or about other important things, please get in touch with us so we can sit down and open your Bible and see what your Bible has to say about these. And if you understand that Jesus is the Son of God, and that you love God enough to want to do what he tells you to do, and that your hope is in the resurrection of Jesus, you want to be joined with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection by being buried with him in water, so that you can be raised to walk a new life, and so that the blood of Jesus will wash away your sins. If you have that understanding, please contact us so that we can help make that a reality. And it may be that you have uh, participated in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus by being buried with him in baptism, but you have strayed along the way. Uh, please contact us so that we can get together with you and pray with you and pray for you and do whatever we can to help you along your way. Let's live with each other. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your instructions, your wise instructions that you give us that teach us how we should live and, and how we should conduct our lives. Please be with us as we seek to be united by living with each other. We just pray that you help us to look to Paul's words and, and look for examples and instructions that we could follow. Thank you so much that your word is your word and that it's not man-made and it's not something that different people have made up or invented, that it truly is your word that has the power to save souls. Thank you for the message of Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in that death, burial, and resurrection by being buried in water to come out to start a new life. Be with us throughout this week and, and help us to look at each other and to find ways to, to love each other and to live in love with each other. And pray that you be with us and give us the strength to do that. Thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.